I'm at the point where people just start dropping as they do, you know, as they do, as we do, as yes. we do, as we do, as we do, as black folks do, even if we just work at the the store down the street just from the stress of being in this world. And so I keep sort of going, OK, I need to start drinking more water. <laughs> I need to start doing push ups and sit ups. I need to, like, try to get outside and get some fresh air. I need all those things. And you do it for a couple of days, but then you get caught back up in the loop of Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting. And then I live in Northern California. Don't go outside today because the air is on fire and you can't breathe outside. Welcome to Culturati, Conversations with Kierna Mayo. I'm Kierna. On Culturati, we explore the connection between the culture, the community, and the self through a Black feminist lens. The show is a mix of cultural news and honest conversation with leading creatives that goes deeper than the usual hype. We get into pop culture and politics, media, sex and struggle. Everything is fair game. So, here's the episode where I get to geek out and bond a bit with a fellow Black quasi-journalist. I'll get into the quasi part later. What matters is that we are now entering my happy place. To know me is to know that I adore most anyone who self-identifies as writer, editor, essayist, journalist, storyteller, reporter, griot. It's honestly a whole thing for me. Whenever I learn of this peculiar path about a person of color, I involuntarily start caring about them way more than I care about the rest of y'all. Just relax. You know I'm kidding. But what I know for sure is this kind of work, the kind where the core of what you do comes with a whole lot of witnessing, and then, wait for it, truth-telling can be brutal. Sometimes the stories are brutal on the receivers, the community about whom we report, but sometimes, oftentimes, the stories are also brutal on the soul and psyche, even on the body of the messenger. I've always been particularly concerned with the plight of Black people in the media, especially the ones who cover race in America and the hard-hitting realities of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, of poor people, of women, of the disabled, of the disenfranchised. Let me keep it 100. This work is hella hazardous, and all of this is personal. Hell, I've been concerned about my own plight. On more than one occasion, as it relates to covering Black people, I've questioned my own mental wellness. Here's my girl, writer and journalist Patrice Peck, reading from her New York Times article entitled Self-Care for Black Journalists. It was published in the midst of the reckoning, in the midst of the pandemic, July of 2020, but it is worth revisiting. It's part of what inspired this episode. The news today is filled with grief, especially for Black journalists reporting on violence against Black people, socioeconomic disparities underscored by the coronavirus pandemic, and racism in the workplace. The situation is complicated by the fact that often they are doing this work for publications where most of the staff is white. Robin D. Stone, a licensed mental health counselor specializing in trauma-informed treatment says, quote, Black journalists like nurses or psychotherapists or anyone else who regularly hears or views trauma narratives may experience vicarious trauma or distress that stems from repeated exposure to the trauma of others. They may feel especially vulnerable that the person on the respirator or in the violent video could be them or someone they love, end quote. Now, no one is about to give Black journalists a hero's parade or start collectively clapping for them after work at 7 p.m. But quietly, maybe we should. I sporadically refer to myself as a journalist because the better part of my career involves some form of reporting and writing, but I have never not had an opinion. Here I am talking that talk, giving the keynote at the Ebony Power 100 back when I was editor-in-chief. We mean to be progressive and provocative. We really do mean power to the people. We mean to be stunningly gorgeous and intellectual and brave. We mean to be black, 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 blackity black. Because we love us 
and we have infinite hope for our people. So there's your quasi. Journalism is fundamentally understood as an objective endeavor, and there are such things as hard facts. But fam, if you believe that American newsrooms aren't subjective institutions, I've got a bridge to sell you at a majorly discounted friends and family rate. But just for you though, homie. Facts always beg context and perspective. And yet the question remains, whose? Who are the storytellers we should trust? Quasi means, quote, having some resemblance, end quote. My career has had some resemblance to journalism and has also had some resemblance to you better tell black people the whole truth and y'all could call that whatever you want. A storytelling, quasi-journalisming person I wholeheartedly trust is W. Kamau Bell, host of CNN's Emmy-winning documentary series, United Shades of America. Years back, Kamau and I appeared together on a few episodes of CNN's Don Lemon Tonight, but we reconnected in the summer of 21 for a secret clandestine project he was up to that actually, if I'm going to keep it really real, is an example of how sometimes this kind of work can make a Black person sick to her stomach. I remember saying that I'd love to talk to you, but damn it, please, not about that. Right. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've I've heard I've heard that a lot. Yes. <laughs> over this over the course of this project that we will name later. Yes. Yeah, so it was only my commitment to your success, young man. I heard that that was made clear to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Kamal is a self-proclaimed socio-political comedian. Although, what's comedy without commentary? And if you've ever seen his stand-up with his wry, self-deprecating, smarty pants sense of humor. You know, bruhs, well, funny. A mixed race kid is like walking around with a conversation starter, whether you want to have the conversation or not. You know what I'm talking about? But on the socio-political tip, Kamal covers the smorgasbord of the struggle, from reparations and wealth inequality to black trans lives to the very extreme problem with police to white supremacy. Well, it's all white supremacy. To reproductive rights, if we can even still call it that. After the murderous cop Derek Chauvin snuffed out George Floyd's life, I saw Kamau making rounds on late night talk shows trying to explain the bizarre dichotomy of being black in America. The big thing I want to say is forget the protests. If people are have good jobs, they have access to health care, their kids are educated, the criminal justice system is there to protect them and work for them, not be against them, then it's hard for people to break a window. You know what I'm saying? Like if everybody's yeah. happy... You can't go, man, everybody's well-fed and happy. Want to break this window with me? No, I don't want to break this window. I got to be at work in the morning. (laughs) It was a time that we were all emotionally overwhelmed. I was so glad Kamal was there to rep for us, but I remember almost feeling sorry for the brother. He's out here really doing the work, really representing. And despite how riveting the show is, I know that collecting these stories is not always easy. Kamal's CNN Emmy-winning show, United Shades of America, is not to be missed. He travels around the country talking to people about all the isms, but not just talking about them, also uncovering how these real systems impact human lives and interrogating why it is in the first damn place. If you haven't seen season six, you should. It was so powerful, and he's gearing up for a seventh season, dropping in 2022. It's funny. This is one of those conversations that I don't have in public that often because I realize that at the end of the day and at the beginning of the day and even in the middle of the day, I'm in an incredibly privileged position to tell these stories. And because it's showbiz, I'm being paid well to tell these stories. And while at the same time, I know that, like, I'm not in that position where if the show gets canceled tomorrow, I'm back out there trying to figure it out like everybody else. So it's, I haven't crossed. Come out at the Apollo. Yeah, I haven't crossed yet <laughs> at amateur night at the Apollo, trying not to get booed. I haven't crossed some sort of threshold where I can relax. So I think there is like a, there's a internal struggle of like how well people perceive you doing versus how well you feel like you're doing. And also, if I look like I'm saying it's hard to tell stories about oppression, what does that mean for the people whose stories I'm telling? Mm. So all I can do in public generally is just show that I'm being affected by those stories and wear my heart on my sleeve. So that's why, you know, I think the first season of the show, I cried in an episode. And as I was filming it, I was like, 
I don't know if they hired this comedian to cry on this show, but I'm crying and I trust this cameraman to film it. I don't know what we'll do with it. But then it became a thing where like that became like it's not just about a comedian. It's about a human being whose job is to be a comedian. But my first job is to be a human being. Uh, I can't help but think about my mom in moments like this of like hearing her talk to her friends about racism and activism. She was playing Martin Luther King Jr. records in the house. And, and at the time, I was like, why do I have to? <laughs> can't, can't we put some temptations on or so, you know? Yeah. And to stand here and realize that she was building the bridge for me to be here right now talking to you. So you honor your mother by doing the same thing to your kids? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I knew I'd get emotional. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Yeah. Uh. You know, I've sort of gotten used to in the history of the show just wearing my heart on my sleeve as I do in my life. But at the same time, like, I'm like, man, why couldn't I just do movies with The Rock? You know what I mean? <laughs> And let me be clear, ah, yes. it ain't easy to do movies with The Rock. That's its no, own exactly. skill set and talent level, and I'm not condescending to that. I'm just saying, like, man, it'd be nice to do a rock movie every now and again, <laughs> just to sort of feel like, just to feel like, because everything that comes through is so much about, especially in this era, about pain and suffering. I guess United Shades was about critical race theory before it was cool. <laughs> so as a human being, as a dad, mm -hmm. I got three daughters. I went through all that like remote school inefficient nightmare that it was, not no shade of the teachers in the schools, but it was just hard. And at the same time, I'm on TV talking about George Floyd while my kid's in the other room struggling with the Wi-Fi connection. And maybe there's just no balancing all there truly is to juggle. On the question of maintaining mentally and physically as a Black person who covers race, obviously every health challenge we face isn't about the work. But one still has to wonder. I remember this brilliant brother, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Tremaine Lee from MSNBC. On the Today Show, he told this riveting story about having a heart attack at 38. Thankfully, he survived. Someone else I have a tremendous amount of respect for, Dr. Mark Lamont Hill, the scholar and now anchor at Black News Tonight, recently announced on Instagram that he suffered a heart attack after a simple medical procedure. He's 42. I'm no doctor, but when you hear these stories, it's hard not to make a corollary. Between aging rappers and Black journalists, it's getting impossible to keep up with the medical travesties. I believe there is a toll on the folk who do this work. And the cumulative impact on our mental and physical health is a looming question others have asked as well. I think about the legendary Gwen Eiffel, Brian Monroe. I mean, there are people who we've lost. We can never know the full why. But considering them as journalists, as storytellers, as people who are fighting the good fight in terms of cementing what needs to be said and understood about race in America, I just wonder about the connection between wellness and work. We know that generally black and brown people have notably lower life expectancy than our white counterparts. But when you add in the social determinant of health that is work, and that work is honest Black storytelling about race in America, then what does that do to life expectancy? So what I want to know from Kamal is the same question I have for myself. How are you staying well? I mean, if I'm honest, I'm not doing a good job of that. I think we all entered this pandemic era, and then you get the, the one punch of the pandemic, and then... Like you said, for black folks, whether you're doing this work or not, the second punch of the racial justice era, George Floyd's murder, Breonna Taylor's murder, stirred up a bunch of things so that people were like, right. also in my community. And then there was many after that, as we know. So there was a point of which of like, OK, I just have to hang on through this pandemic. And then when we get back to, quote unquote, normal, I'll be able to hit the reset button. But the reset button, it has not emerged yet. I'm still like, you know, what do they call it? Uh, white knuckling it, like holding on mm. for dear life. Like, OK, if I just can hold on through this and they realize wait, is this how I'm going to be the rest of my life? And then I'm definitely at the age where if I drop dead today, 
it ain't about young. <laughs> it's about, it's about like it's a, it's about like heart attack. Yeah. You would be sad that I was gone, but you would also be like, I know what that dude was doing because I do that work too. And I know right. the stress and strain that puts on somebody. I'm at the point where people just start dropping as they do, you know, as they do, as we do, as yes. we do, as we do, as we do, as black folks do, even if we just work at the the store down the street, just from the stress of being in this world. And so I keep sort of going, OK, I need to start drinking more water. <laughs> I need to start doing push ups and sit ups. I need to, like, try to get outside and get some fresh air I need all those things. And you do it for a couple of days, but then you get caught back up in the loop of Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting after Zoom yes, meeting. After. Yes. And then I live in Northern California. Don't go outside today because the air is on fire and you can't breathe uh, outside. But do the people closest to you, does your wife, do your children, do your parents, do the people who you are still intimate with? feel something shifting is it are you white knuckling at their expense oh wow we're good we're getting super deep <laughs> that's what we do i can see that my mental state and just the way that like i have a office in my house but the thing is is like i sort of try to get done by six o'clock because the kids are at home dinner all this stuff but I sort of walk out of my office with the same energy i just had on a zoom of talking about whatever tragedy i was just talking about and there's not the ride home from work anymore or not the like stopping off at the local pub or the local whatever to have a <laughs> just to like or even just the time on the subway just to breathe and go all right you know and so i come out of there and i don't have anywhere to decompress and so that anxiety and that energy is in the house and the kids are all affected cuz even though they're back at school it's just weird it's still weird like my daughter's best friends are in her other classroom so they have lunch, she can see them, but she can't talk to them because they're not in the same pod. So they're carrying their own energy, but I think also I can feel my energy seeping into them. I sort of look at them like, they're looking at me like I am crazy. <laughs> and, I, and I understand. And so I have to like actively do the thing where you go, I'm going to pretend to not be crazy because that's not good for them. But then my wife can see me pretending not to be crazy. <laughs> like she right, can see right. it. Like, I mean, my kids can probably see it too, but my wife can see it. And it's just like, I'm doing an impression of an impression of myself. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is Culturati. I'm Kira Mayo. Let's get back to W. Kamau Bell and keep talking about the dilemma of Black storytellers. The very first episode of United Shades Season 6 is called Policing the Police. It could have been called, it should have been called, Defunding the Police. But apparently that was a bit too controversial. Kamal casually mentioned that recently on Sway's Universe, a serious XM show. Shout out to my man Sway. Policing the police this first episode of season six? I mean, that's what that's what they call it, but it's really about defunding the police. They just didn't want to put that title on it. So it's really a, a, a full explanation of what it means to defund the police, why, why we need to do it, how it has worked here in Oakland, and, uh, you know, why it's an idea that you shouldn't run to your fading couch when you hear people say. I'm like, hold up, let's unpack that a little. I thought about how Kamal often encourages young people to take up space and have a seat at the table. In other words, not just be in front of the camera, but to consider the power of the gatekeepers. I wanted to understand what goes down in the room when producers or gatekeepers of any sort tells a Black journalist, don't call something by its right name, ostensibly because white people. All these things are like negotiated. Like all these things are like, CBS is not PBS, <laughs> you know, and PBS is not as PBS as it used to be, probably. And so you're sort of aware that, like, that there are going to be times where you're like, it's this. And somebody like, well, according to this metric, it's this. And you have to sort of mm -hmm. go, which battles are the ones that I that I lay it on the line for? And which ones do I go? Eh, I'm going to let that one go. For example, like, as much as I thought the title was not really accurate, and I called it Defund the Police on Twitter when I talked about it, I think. Let's be clear, CNN allowed it to be an extended episode, which is only the second extended episode ever that we've had. So, like, 
we got what we really wanted. If somebody had said, would you prefer the title be Defund the Police or would you prefer 57 minutes of television? I would have said 57 minutes of television. So I think sometimes those things can come off like you compromised or you sold out. It's like, well, no, I don't own a network. I could do the podcast the way I wanted to do it. But the fact is, is that we got 57 minutes of television in front of an audience about Defund the Police that is not going to sit through that anywhere else. Right. Look at CNN being all abolitionist. I love it. <laughs> you know, I'm very close with my boss and we have conversations. And there are times where it's like this, but not this, or I don't know. And there have been times where I've been like, ah, really? Uh. So it's not. And there's times where she's like, yeah, but. Mm. <laughs> so like, <laughs> her name's Amy Antella. She's been in news journalism for like 30 years. Like, so she's got. So she also has a level of knowledge that I don't have and like that I feel like is often helpful to me. But it is a thing where I'm like, what is the content and how am I get, what am I getting in the show that I feel like is not anywhere on this network or on TV in this format? Right. Almost anywhere. You know, I was the former editor in chief of Ebony magazine, right? The most venerable black publication maybe ever mm -hmm. owned by black people. I was the editor in chief of a small magazine called Honey that had its moment in the mm -hmm. sun mm -hmm. owned by white people. And initially, I wanted to ask you just what you thought about the relevance of Black media. But then I felt like there's a more profound question. It's like, what is Black media? Is it Black writers? Is it Black subjects? Is it Black-owned? Is it Black audience? Like, what really makes something in the media Black? For me, it's about the control of the image and voice. In my mind, Insecure, Issa Rae's Insecure, is black media, even though HBO is not owned by any black people. They may have black shareholders, but it is not a black media company. But if you watch Insecure, that is a black woman's voice. You can feel that she's being able to do the things she wants to do and say. And also you feel like if she didn't, she would probably tell us. <laughs> she would probably say, you know. So for me, it's about are you allowed to say and do the things you want to say and do? And are you allowed to put forth the image of black people that you want to put forth? Then that's black media. And you haven't had to have white people focus the story in some way that is not the thing you wanted to say. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, like you haven't, mm -hmm. you are, you have put forth the thing you wanted to put forth and you didn't have somebody come in and go, ah, we're going to need this over here. I'll give you an example of, a, of one of my favorite black media moments in history. It's a story that comes back every now and again because of the internet. It's LL Cool J hired to promote the Gap, and writes a rap to promote the Gap in the sometime in the '90s. And you know, you know the story. He <laughs> he shows up to the set. I, who knows? Maybe he's wearing Gap jeans. Who knows? But he's he's been hired because he has ascended to a level where a multinational clothing corporation is like, we're prepared for a black person to sell to everybody. Yes. And he shows up and he raps and I'm sure the white execs are just like happy that he's there and happy that he's rapping and clearly don't know what he's saying or what he's rapping. And he does a rap about how cool, whatever, whatever. And at the end, he says, for us, for us on the low, which is FUBU. And he's wearing a FUBU hat that is not sold by the Gap. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> not FUBU for a Gap. Not that line. He basically embeds a FUBU commercial inside of a Gap commercial. To me, that's a black media moment. And I say this is somebody who is definitely like, not everybody in the black community sees me as a voice that's on their side. Oh, really? Not on your side? Not on their side? So talk to me about this a little bit. What is that? What do you mean? You know, uh, I mean, for a lot of people, married to a white woman is a full stop. Sort of, kind of, but not really. I mean, what you gonna do? Nuance, not absolutes on culturati. Carry on, bruh. You know. So that, so that even if my politics are correct, married to a white woman is like uh, that another black man in media who found himself a snow bunny. Right. You know, so I sort of at this point understand it, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to doesn't mean I'm going to do a defund the police episode that is only protecting interracial couples. Like, you know, I'm right. just, <laughs> <laughs> we have to stop police brutality against black men and white. Yeah. Men. So I'm still going to like ride for you, even if I'm like, I know, you know, and I've definitely run into people like, ah, you know, so. And because of that, you, then you add in the CNN part of it. That is a black man working at CNN. And then I'm no different than whoever else works at CNN. So who you don't like or who you're like, how are you going to work there when this person's there? How come you haven't called out this person? How come you tell me why this person says this as if we're all in the same cafeteria? So I get that, like, I'm standing on the outside of this. But then I also get that, like, 
on the inside, I'm working hard, as you say in the show, to get really authentic community voices in telling truth and speaking truth to power in ways that I don't believe would be happening if I wasn't there. Yes. And I think I'm honest with myself about the fact, yeah, I work for a corporation. I work for CNN. I'm not trying to pretend like that somehow I can get away from that. That's why it's important for me to end that space. If you look at the show, the show has gotten sharper and the attack has gotten sharper the longer I've been there because I've learned more how to do it. And now if I had been still, (laughs) as much as I think some people would like this, maybe even people who work at CNN, if every season kicked off with like, I'm back with the KKK to talk to them about what they think about what's going on. Yes. (laughs) Yes. But I've actually like worked hard to not do that again. Black folks have been meeting with the Klan for a minute. Yeah. And that's why we had on the episode we did that was basically the sequel last season's, uh, the episode Mm -hmm. on white supremacy. I met with Daryl Davis, the black man who befriends the Klan. Because people thought I was, like, trying to bite his style. I'm like, no, no, th- he can go keep meeting with the Klan if he wants to. I've done my time with the Klan. I'm not in for a penny and for a pound with that. You bring joy to the show, too, though, Kamal. And obviously you're a comedian, but I have a feeling that what you're doing is more intentional than just, like, a side joke and laughter. It seems like you're finding moments for joy. Am I making that up? Or is it really important to you? I mean, it's... It, I wouldn't have the job if it wasn't about the fact that I wanted to, like, have some fun with even this painful stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, as quiet as it's kept, it's funny. I I didn't apply as a journalist. I applied as a comedian. And I don't think they were looking for a journalist. They were looking for somebody who was not a journalist. Now, the thing that is important to me is that it is journalistically rigorous so that I'm not saying dates wrong. And when we have gotten wrong, we've corrected them. But, like, it actually holds up to journalism. But to me, it's all opinion. It sort of lives in like, what's my opinion or what are my thoughts or what am I learning? And the best way for people to take that is if we also can make it fun at the same time. Or if you can see me and somebody having a painful conversation, but then finding a way to laugh about it. From season two, we did an episode, Standing Rock, when Standing Rock was happening. And it's me and Adam Beach, the actor Adam Beach. And he's talking about how in movies, he always has to play the like sort of the traditional, not always, but there's an effort to push native actors into traditional roles. And if you don't have that role, you don't get seen at all. And he goes, they like us in the 1800s. And I took a beat and I said, they like us in the 1800s too. (laughs) (laughs) And we both laughed out loud at this really dark idea, (laughs) you know? And so for me, like finding those moments of laughter or finding ways to like, when we have these graphic packages to sort of talk about a thing, to make those funny and joyful, is like, I know people will remember them if they're funny. This is Culturati. I'm Kierna. Let's get back to W. Kamal Bell and I talking about the realities of Black storytellers in media. I want to touch more on his family life and hear about the interracial dynamic of his marriage. The only line I have is around how much my kids are in front of the camera. Mm. That's the only like line that I have to negotiate because sometimes somebody will interview me and I'll tell a story about my kids. Then I'll get an email. So we're going to need pictures of your children. And we're going to need. <laughs> 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 and I've gotten real good at like, I'm not doing that. Oh, 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 yeah, I guess I understand. I understand. I don't need to give the people who don't like what I'm doing more ammunition. And people love to attack your family, even if they've never seen a picture of them. The idea that I would invite that to them. And that they might hear about it or that or they might see their image somewhere where somebody was trying to weaponize it against use their image to weaponize it against me. I think I'd have if, like I the feeling that I get thinking about it. I feel like I'd have to if I saw something that was using my kid's image in a way that I felt like was being inappropriate. I'd have to call CNN and be like, OK, I'm, I'm quitting my job because my job now is to find this person. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's my my new job. I think yeah. there's a move. I'm pretty sure Denzel did that before. Yes. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and I went down. Famously that a happened. Denzel stand. So I would I would go about his uh, <laughs> okay. I would use his blueprint. <laughs> the, I would use yes. the man on fire blueprint or the John Q blueprint. And then I imagine it's more compounded for you because you have a white wife and because people assign certain things to that. Mm-hmm. Melissa, right? And yeah, I Melissa. know that she, and you've been together quite a while. Me and Melissa have been together 18 years. That means, and I think this is the other part that I feel good about my relationship with Melissa is because she didn't come around last Wednesday. 
Right. She didn't show up like, oh, look at you with your three Emmys in your TV show. Uh, I think I'm in love with you. <laughs> it's not like she's been she she literally like helped build this. You know, yes. like I had been a comedian, but I had not been a successful comedian. And so she's got receipts to go. I was there for these things and also helped guide me and give me counsel. That doesn't mean that she does everything that I need her to do at every moment. You know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't mean, for example. You, you mean as a white person? As a white person. Got it. Mm -hmm. She recognizes the difference between white lady feminism and feminism. So let's be clear about yes. that. So she understands these sort of some of these racial dynamics. But it doesn't mean when George Floyd is killed that the conversation I have with her is the only conversation I need to have about that. Yeah. And I think she understands that. I'm going to say I think she, under she understands that. Like, so it's not like it's like it doesn't replace my blackness. And she's not trying to substitute for my blackness. She's not. I always say it's like I didn't marry the white woman who only dated black guys, which is a whole different right. style of like, you know. That's another style. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's another thing. <laughs> like, so, right. So that, but like, you're talking about her. I'm asking about you. I'm saying are there places where you just can't go or are there places where are you resolved? Like her grandfather was certainly not excited about the idea of his granddaughter dating a black man and then getting married to a black man. And it was like we've been together 18 years. It was several years of us having to figure of Melissa having to figure it out, because at one point I was like, I'm just not going to go around your family anymore if he's there. I'm out. Mm -hmm. And she understood it, but then she also has a really close family. Then she would go to these places where everybody's partner was there and I wasn't there. Right. And so then it became about like, she's like, I can't keep living like this. And she confronted him. And in the moment that she confronted him, he just sort of completely melted. It was like, you're right. I've been an idiot. I'm so sorry. It was Thanksgiving. The moment, this was years ago now because he's passed away. She was basically like, if you don't accept Kamau, then you won't be seeing me around here anymore. And so for me, like, that's a moment where you find out what everybody's made of, how committed everybody is to each other. And that's not a moment everybody's going to do for their partner. Because I never asked her to do that. I wasn't going to say it's me or your I was like, I'm not going to be around. And she's like, but I want you around. And I'm like, well, I can't do that if he's going to be every, if every time I walk into the room, he treats me like a ghost. I'm not going to. And so she was like, the way to do this is to confront him, not to say, come out, deal with it. And so in that moment, he totally melted was like i've been an idiot you're right and the first time he ever shook my hand was like a few weeks later i walked in and he shook my hand and he said happy thanksgiving and it's like even thinking of it now i start to get like emotional about it because it was like super we're talking about years of zero conversation had never looked me in the eye Damn. then off of the strength of that you know, I didn't, we weren't the best of buddies, but just slowly I had indicators of things that were like, oh, this guy is changing. And he's, you know, we're talking about a 80 year old Sicilian American, not regular Italian, Sicilian Italian. And by the end, he watched nothing but Fox News and the Food Network, except if my show was on, he'd watch CNN. <laughs> I love it. And at one point he would say, he's like, where are you off to next? And I was like, oh, I'm going to New York. He's like, man, I tell everybody that my grandson, he's traveling all over the country. He's always his grandson. Wow. His grandson, like, <laughs> and you're and you're in the wow. moment trying to like try not to cry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yes, I appreciate you. I really, I've learned so much from watching your last six seasons. So thank you, and don't stop. You know, I say this all the time. People are in the streets are like, keep up the work. I was like, we got to, like, we got to, not me. We have to. Y'all. Is your inner black media person feeling satiated like mine? It was so great to get to be in conversation with someone who does the kind of work I admire so much. The kind I really want to emulate. The kind that uncovers real stories and brings them to the masses. Black stories, brown stories, indigenous stories. The kind that rests on exploring the human condition while not ignoring the systems that shape it. The New Yorker once said W. Kamau Bell's gimmick is, quote, intersectional progressivism. Hello for a gimmick. I appreciate this man. Be kind to a Black person in the media today. They're heroes, too. Look for W. Kamau Bell on his CNN Emmy-winning show, United Shades of America, also streaming on HBO Max. It's a worthy 42 minutes of your life. You'll think, laugh, and yes, BIPOC person in America, Sometimes you'll cry.
Culturati Conversations with Kierna Mayo is presented by Breakbeat and produced by PRX Productions. I'm the host and chief creator, Kierna Mayo. Our production team is Florence Barrow Adams, Sierra Spragley Ricks, Jonathan Cabral, and Jocelyn Gonzalez. Dave Mays and Kendrick Ashton are executive producers for Breakbeat. Visit breakbeatmedia.com or at Breakbeat Media on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you're feeling culturati, be sure to follow me at Kierna Mayo. That's K I E R N A M A Y O on Instagram and Twitter. Share, comment, and subscribe to Culturati wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening to Culturati Conversations with Kierna Mayo. We'll be back every couple weeks. Come talk with me.